Hello everyone. Today I'm going to talk about mathematical modeling of COVID-19. I'm not going to talk about any maths. I'll talk about the fundamental principles behind that in very simple terms. Hope you'll find this short discussion useful. And in future sessions, I'll try to show you how to do that using different statistical softwares or packages. So when an outbreak starts happening in a particular community or in a region, the question that comes to our mind is that to what direction it will be going in future. If there is one case, from that are we going to get two cases? From that are we going to get four cases? And then eight and then 16? So when I say this, I actually assumed some fundamental principles behind the transmission of COVID-19. The first thing is that from one case, how many new cases can happen? And that is known as reproduction number. Now, if the disease is completely new in a particular community, if everybody is susceptible to that particular disease or infection, and people are mixing freely, then this reproduction number is also called basic reproduction number. And this is what it was like when COVID, COVID first started happening in China and in, in, in other parts of the world. But now, since the disease has occurred in all over the world, we may not be able to tell, talk about basic reproduction number or R0 or R0. We'll be discussing more about the effective reproduction number, which tells us about from one case, how many new cases can happen in a community where some of the people have have already had the disease where people are not mixing freely maybe there are restrictions where people are immune so even without having the disease they have developed protection against the infection so this is one concept that is very important in terms of thinking about mathematical modeling of COVID-19 or transmission of COVID-19 in a particular community. So this R or reproduction number, it depends on what? It depends on a few things. The first thing is that if someone is infected, then what is the infectious period of that person? How long that person can transmit the virus to others? Number two, how many people that person is, in, is getting in touch with during that infection period, infectious period? And number three, if that person gets in touch with a healthy individual or a susceptible individual, what is the probability that that person will be able to transmit the virus to the other person? And if we think about all these three aspects of reproduction number, you'll see that how our current, current control measures are nicely fed into these different aspects of disease transmissibility. 
How long a person can remain infectious? That depends on the viral load. That depends on how much that person has actually gathered or acquired the infection. That depends on how quickly that person goes under treatment. And the second point is how many person that infectious person gets in touch with. Now, when someone is identified as having COVID, what we are doing now, we are asking that person to isolate. And by doing that, we are actually reducing the number of persons that particular individual is going to get in touch with. Even if the infectious period of that person is, for example, two weeks or 10 days, that person will not be able to transmit the virus to others because that person is going into isolation. And the third thing is, even if someone gets in touch with another person, what is the probability that that person will be, the infected person will be able to transmit the virus to the uninfected person? It will depend on the virus strain. We know that the Delta virus, Delta variant is more transmissible. It will depend on whether the infected person is wearing mask whether the other person was wearing mask. It will depend on whether they were maintaining the physical distancing or not. It will depend on whether people were doing hand washing. So you can see that the reproduction number depends on a few factors and we are actually already acting on those factors. Now let's go back to mathematical modeling of COVID-19. So one thing that we always try to calculate when we do mathematical modeling is this R, this reproduction number. And in, in the current scenario, we are dealing with effective reproduction number. Now, when we were doing one, when we will be doing that modeling, we will actually come up with an estimate, which is an outcome or product of all these human behavior that have occurred as of now, if we are doing to, going to do a forecasting or projection for the future. So we will you be using the cases, the number of cases over time that have occurred so far. And these cases are outcomes or products of infection, people's movement, their behavior. And based on that, we will say, okay, then over the next few weeks or months, we are going to see these number of cases, we're going to see an increase or decrease in number of cases. Now, as I said before at the very beginning, that the question that we always think is that, are we going to get two cases from one if the reproduction number is two? And from those two, are we going to get four and then eight? We are actually talking about the exponential increase in number of cases. Now, when we are so much aware of COVID, we are going into so many interventions. Will this exponential growth occur? Let's think about the population of a particular community in terms of COVID, its infection, its spread. We can divide the people into different groups. There are people who are susceptible. 
if they get in touch with someone who has COVID, they can be infected and develop COVID. There are people who are already exposed to COVID. They came in touch with someone who were having COVID, who were infectious, who were having the SARS coronavirus 2 infection. So we are having a group of people who are susceptible. We are having a group of people who are exposed. And then there are people who are infected. So they are having the virus. They can spread the virus to others. So they are infected and they are infectious. And then they develop the disease. And after that, thankfully, most of them will recover. And after recovery, they'll develop the immunity in their body. So even if they become, they get in touch with someone else who were having the infection because they already developed the immunity, at least for some time, they will not get the virus or develop the disease. So we are talking about four different groups of people, those who are susceptible, those who are exposed, those who are infected or infectious, and those who are recovered, who has developed the immunity. Thankfully, we now have vaccines for COVID. So we are also having groups of people, many of us, who are developing the immunity against COVID without having the infection. So those people also will go into the fourth group that is recovered or immune because they are no longer susceptible. And this is one of the fundamental principles of mathematical modeling of COVID-19. This is different than the exponential perspective or exponential thoughts about COVID-19 disease transmission, where we said that from 1 to 2, 2 to 4, 4 to 8, we are talking about something different. We are talking about different compartments. We are talking about sending people in different groups, compartmentalization of the community. And depending on how many people, how much, what proportion of the people are in each of the groups, the transmission of the disease will occur. This is called SEIR model. Now let's go back to the first question. If there is an outbreak in a community, what is going to happen next? And then now let's think about the SEIR model. Then we'll have to think about what proportion of the people are susceptible? We'll have to think about what proportion of people are exposed and we have contact tracing team who are identifying the contacts of cases and asking them to go into quarantine. And then what proportion of the people are infected? And we are interviewing the cases and asking them to isolate. And then we are treating people so that they can recover well. We are going into vaccination. So what proportion of the people are have already received the two doses of COVID vaccine, the vaccination coverage? All these will decide whether the outbreak will go up or go down whether the R0 will go out, up or go down, not R0, whether the effective reproduction number will go up or go down. And we know that the reproduction number, if it is more than one, then the outbreak will continue to grow. If it is one, then it will become endemic. The disease will stay there, but it will not go up to that level. If it is less than one, then the outbreak will gradually subside. So if we go back to the question again, what will happen if there is an outbreak in a community? 
it will depend on the public health interventions that are currently in, in place. It will depend on the vaccination rates, the vaccination programs. It will depend on whether the case detection and contact tracing are happening effectively. Are people testing sufficiently? So these are all the fundamental principles behind mathematical modeling of COVID-19. And of course, in addition to all these measures, we have lockdown. Many countries, many cities, many regions went into lockdown at different times. But now, since the vaccination has started, vaccination coverage has gone very high, people are coming out of lockdown because it has got a negative impact on the community, on, on the economy, on the psychosocial health. But that was also another measure that could be incorporated into our modeling, into our thoughts. So when we will be doing the mathematical modeling, we'll have to think about this SEIR model. We'll have to think about the compartmentalization of people. We'll have to incorporate all these into our modeling. Even if we cannot do that, even if we just do simple projections or simple forecasting, we'll know that the numbers that we are see seeing is a product or an outcome of all these different factors in real life settings. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. I'll get back to you in future with more about mathematical modeling of COVID-19. And I'll try to show you how to do that using different packages. Thank you.